where we met Friedman. Shana Tava. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you. We're uh, finally here. We're finally in 5781. Um, it'd be a great year for everybody. And finally, however, we have something else to worry about other than the elections, which is are our sins going to be forgiven between now and Yom Kippur, which is going to be on the 28th on Monday. And... Um, the big question is, can all sins be forgiven regardless of whether people knowingly commit them, unknowingly, whether they commit them because the society says it's okay and they just go with the flow, not really understanding what is really happening. We do lack a lot of knowledge to understand what is a sin, what is not a sin. Our morality is a little bit shaky right now. So the big question is, should we be worried? <laughs> <laughs> you already comforted it and explained it all. <laughs> uh, we should be we should be sensitive and we should be concerned. But worried? No. Yom Kippur is the the anniversary of forgiveness. So we will be forgiven. It's just useful <laughs> to know what we're being forgiven for. <laughs> we, we don't even know which sins we're, we're, we're guilty of. That's how, uh, how unintentional our sins are. So um, the desire to get better obviously is always a good thing um, how many how many ways how many opportunities do we have for getting better you pick one whatever improvement you want to do is perfect because every mitzvah is equal to every other mitzvah and when you are in the in the act of busy doing a mitzvah, you are exempt of all other mitzvahs. So we needn't worry, am I doing the right mitzvah? Should I be doing a different mitzvah? When you're doing any mitzvah, you are exempt of all the other mitzvahs for the, for the duration. So worry is not the right word. God will forgive that's without a question. But will we take advantage of that? You know, having, having regained our innocence, what will we do with it? So really, the scary day, if there is one, is the day after Yom Kippur. <laughs> <laughs> now that you're forgiven, <laughs> you've got a clean slate. Now be careful. Rabbi Friedman, but... The Torah says that there are certain things that can't be forgiven for, like adultery um, and um, now I'm wrong, you're shaking your head. Yeah, adultery is not one of them, but I know what you're talking about. Okay. So, there are different levels of forgiveness for different levels of sin. <clears throat> there are some sins that are forgiven as soon as you stop. Can you give us examples of those, please? M most sins. If you say, I'm not doing that anymore, you're forgiven. Some sins um, are not forgiven until, t until Yom Kippur. So your regret is not enough. You have to regret and have Yom Kippur come. Then there are sins that your regret and Yom Kippur do not erase, but suffering erases it. So any kind of suffering that a person goes through erases sins. Then there are those sins that even that doesn't erase, only death itself erases. And then there are those sins for which death itself is also not enough. You have to go through the adjustment before you can go into heaven, and that adjustment erases all the sins. 
So in the end, they're all forgivable. Because a father can forgive anything. You pretty much erased my entire preparation oh, you <laughs> for, for today's program. Let's start all over again. Let's start all over again. <laughs> because I had levels of primary sins, secondary sins, th- uh, sins that are done unknowingly, knowingly, the levels of um, uh, punishment for them, even though I know very well that you said that um, really... Uh, our world is not about um, uh, reward and punishment. Um, right. So I have been paying attention. But um, still, yeah. I would like to talk about this uh, severity of uh, sins and consequences. So, so Rambam says that there are a number of sins, a whole list of, sorry, 24, that are hard to do tshuva for. They're hard to regret. And of course, the most common one is the sin you don't realize is a sin. If you don't realize it's a sin, why would you ever regret it? So the ignorance, not knowing that it's a sin, not knowing the severity of sin, not knowing the consequences, the damage that it does, etc., etc. If you don't know, then you're never moved to regret. So that's hard to repent, but it's also not punishable because it's unintentional. It's out of ignorance. So it's it's interesting how um, the ones that are the hardest to make up for are the ones that are least punishable. So it kind of balances out. But the real beauty of it is that Rambam is talking about doing tshuva, which means patching up your relationship with God. And he says that there are some things that are hard to patch up. What are those? The ones that are not really punishable. Well, then why would you want to patch it up? You see, it's not about the punishment. Even when I know that God will forgive me, it still bothers me that I was so insensitive and so careless with his will. And that's really what Yom Kippur is all about. You can be forgiven the day before Yom Kippur, and and you probably are. But Kippur doesn't mean forgiveness. It means cleansing, which means erase the insult, not the damage. The damage is erased. God forgives you, and he'll never bring it up. It's gone. And yet we want to do tshuva for it. That's beautiful. That's a real relationship. I know you forgive me, but I'm still very upset with myself for having for having been so insensitive. So cleansing means, you know, you have a friend and you're really close, and then your friend does something offensive, harmful to you, and you're angry. You don't talk for a while. And then your friend apologizes. And you forgive. Forgiven. No grudge. No anger. No resentment. Nothing. But it's not like it used to be. And that's what we want to do tshuva for. Just for that little something that makes it different than the way it used to be. That's what Kippur means. I know I'm forgiven, but can we be as close as we were before the sin? 
may be closer because of the forgiveness, that's Yom Kippur. That's beautiful, not just legalistic. So the legal stuff, you can do tshuva any day of the year. You don't need Yom Kippur for that. Yom Kippur takes it to another level. Once forgiven, you're not only as good as new, <laughs> as if you never sinned. On the contrary, you're closer because of the sin. So let me try to explain this a little bit. Imagine you have a child and you love your child with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Perfect kid. What's not to love? Then the kid does something horrendous. You can't look at him. But after a while, the child apologizes, you get back together, all is forgiven, all is forgotten, and you love your child more than before. True. Factual. The question is, how can you love more than before when before you already loved your child with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might? Where did you get this increased love? So if you didn't love your child with all your heart, okay, so now it, the, the, um, the untapped love is now being expressed. But there was no untapped love before. You loved your child with all your heart, which means with all the love you have in your repertoire. <clears throat> so where, where did you get more love from? And the answer is, some of the anger, the hurt, and the hate that you were feeling has now transformed into love and you have more love capacity than you had before. Because the anger that you felt has to go somewhere. You can't just erase. Forgive and forget. The anger was real. Where is it going to go? Well, forget about it. Never mind. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. So some of the anger literally dissipates. Some of it becomes love. The same is true with forgiveness. It's not that when you're forgiven, you're back to what was. Something's got to change. It can't be exactly the same. Before, you loved your friend because she never hurt you. Now she did hurt you. It's not the same. So either it's going to be a little weaker than before, because the resentment did not completely go away, or it's going to be better than before because some of the resentment has now become love. That's the dynamics of forgiveness. But I also want to mention that there are two kinds of forgiveness. And we actually mention it many, many times in, in the text of the, uh, of the prayers on, on Yom Kippur. There's one kind of forgiveness that comes from you, from your nature. We might say that most human beings are naturally forgiving. Because if we didn't forgive, <laughs> if we were incapable of forgiving, we would be overwhelmed with resentment. We would have bad feelings against almost everybody in our lives. <laughs> we let things go, naturally. At least little things. Why do we let them go? 
because we don't want the weight, the pain, and the burden of resentment and grudges and hatred. We don't want it. I don't want to carry that around. It's, it's you know, they charge for baggage these days. <laughs> I don't want baggage and I don't want to pay for it. So, yes, I forgive you. In fact, I forgive you before you even ask. Which means it's not really about you. It's about me. I want to forgive you because I don't want to carry this around. And an uglier level, I want to forgive you. I don't want to carry around my resentment because as long as I am resentful towards you, you're still in my life. <laughs> I don't want you in my life. So I forgive you to get you out of my life. Now, it is forgiveness. You can't, you can't deny that. It's forgiveness because I will never mention it. I will not take revenge. I will not punish you. It's gone. But so are you. <laughs> You're gone out of my life. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to see you. And I don't want to bear a grudge against you. Now, in some way, uh, we refer to God as the ultimate, compassionate, forgiving king. It is your nature to forgive, we say many times in the, in the prayers. Not only that, you are abundant in forgiveness. A human being can forgive once or twice, not a third time. So if you keep doing it, eventually I, I stop forgiving. This cannot go on. But with God, I can apologize this year for the same sin I apologized for last year, and the year before, and the year before, and the year before. And each time God will forgive. That's called abundant in forgiveness. So we ask God to forgive us because of his nature to forgive. It's not the best forgiveness because we don't know what the result is. Now I'm forgiven. Do, do I still exist in your world, in your mind, in your heart? So wipe away the sin means wipe away every memory of me. Don't want that. <clears throat> so there's another kind of forgiveness that is called Salachti Kidvorecha. When Moses, when Moshe asked God to forgive the people for making the golden calf, God said, eventually, God said, I forgive as you requested, as you spoke. Meaning to say, I'm forgiving in response to your words. That's much better. That's, for example, the friend of yours who hurt you comes and apologizes. Now, you don't want to hear it, because in your mind, you're done. This friendship is over. I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to see you. I don't want to deal with you. You're gone out of my life. I just don't care anymore. And then you come and you say whatever you say, and to my own surprise, your words got to me. You moved me. And I'm surprised because I, I was sure that no matter what you would say, it would make no effect. It would make no difference, but it does which tells me that deep down inside, I really do want you in my life. And it was only the anger that was covering it up. So now I'm going to forgive you because your words get to me. That's much better. And that's the forgiveness of Yom Kippur. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't have to spend all day in the synagogue saying all these wonderful things. <laughs> Just say, I'm sorry, and go home. Yeah, but then you don't know what kind of forgiveness you're getting. Are you getting the forgiveness that says, sure, of course I forgive you, just don't call me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want that. Rabbi Friedman, but what we say in the synagogue are not our own words. They are written words. They're the words that yes. we're supposed to say. Yeah, because <laughs> we don't know what to say. <laughs> we, we don't even know what we did wrong. We don't know anything. All we know is that we were neglecting God in many ways. I don't know which is the severe sin, the non-severe sin. I don't know how many times I did it. I don't know how callous I was. I don't know. We really don't know. We are the last ones to be able to judge ourselves um, impartially. So I, I, I wouldn't even try to assess my own virtue or lack of. So the sages did us a great favor. They formulated the prayers with exactly the right words, saying exactly the right things. And then we are told that when we pray, when we, when we say those words, and we don't really understand them fully, our thoughts should be, accept my prayers with all the meaning that the sages saw in these words, because I don't. So accept them as if I did understand what the sages understood, and as if I did appreciate the meaning and the depth and the beauty of these words that the sages saw. So we're saying exactly what we need to say, and that's effective. If we had to bumble our way through it, you know, people say, wouldn't my own words, my own prayer be more meaningful? No. Because <laughs> you don't know what to say. Look, if you were asked to say a few words to the king, even to the president, you would spend time preparing. You would write it down, you would review it, you would rehearse it. You don't just walk in and talk. Because with a king, you, 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 you got to watch what you say. Sometimes you'll underestimate the power of your words, and you'll ask for a tiny little blessing when you could have asked for much more. And sometimes you'll ask for things that are way beyond you, and you have no business even getting involved in that. Like, for example, people who come to Shul on Yom Kippur and pray for world peace. It's a beautiful thought. But you're not a world leader. <laughs> Ask for peace in your family. Ask for peace of mind in your own soul. Asking for world peace means you're, you're, you're neglecting yourself. That's like the guy says, I can tell when there's a, there's a couple sitting in a restaurant, I can tell whether they're married or not, whether they're in love or not. If they're talking about world peace, they're not married and they're not in love. <laughs> That's why they're talking about stuff that is irrelevant to them. If they're talking politics, they're not in love. If they are in love, they would be talking about the petty little things that make each of their lives a little more comfortable or uncomfortable. Love is in the tiny details, not in global affairs. So the point is that the sages know what words are effective, what issues are appropriate, 
And if you look at the words, you'll see. There is nothing you want to say that they have not said for you. It's all there. And more. Robert Friedman, but yet we are encouraged, especially I know the Bratzlaff teachings, to speak from the heart, to be very passionate when you speak to God, to really pour your heart out, to really connect in that sense. Um, is that contradictory or not? Well, that's not prayer. It's certainly not the formulated prayer of three times a day. And you know what that is really? That's like bearing your soul It's almost like confessing your own ignorance. <laughs> I'm going to pour my heart out and make a total fool of myself. <laughs> But, you know, you can't hide from God. He knows what kind of fool you are. You might as well just say it. So pouring your heart out is really like a, a humbling admission of pettiness, smallness, ignorance. But it's, it's very healthy. But it's not prayer. Those are not the words God needs to hear. Those are the words you need to say. So there's a difference. And it's like the wife who complains to her husband that he never says, I love you. He says, but I do love you. She says, I know. But why don't you say it? He says, if I love you and you know it, why do I have to say it? In other words, to him, those words are unnecessary. They don't do anything. To her, means everything. So should the husband say, I love you, even though it does nothing for him? Yes, if you're asking me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, that, knowing what it means to her? He should say that more than he should say his own words. So it's true. When a man says, I love you, to his wife, it, it does nothing to him. Well, it does because it gives him a happy wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> wow. So the, the formulated prayers that the sages gave us Those are the words that God loves to hear. Maybe to me it means nothing. But knowing what it means to him, I will say it, and I will say it carefully and respectfully and sincerely. In some way, it's more powerful than my own words, because my own words only express me. Here I'm trying to reach God, not reach me. So self-expression is a healthy thing, but it doesn't connect you to God. It really lets you know who you are. Awesome. Thank you. Now, Because God already knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the big question is, what happens to all the Jewish people on Yom Kippur? They make a whole turnaround. People who all year long don't think about God, don't think about religion. All of a sudden, Yom Kippur is a big day for everybody. And everybody is trying to fast and go to the synagogue and listen to the shofar and just be a different person on that day. We were in a hotel for Rosh Hashanah in Florida. The hotel is closed. There were no other guests other than our group. Except that they have a golf course and people come to play golf without staying at the hotel. As I was walking to the, uh, to the main hall, this guy with his golf bag was walking in the opposite direction. And to my surprise, he said, Shana Tova. Hmm. And he kept on walking. And it occurred to me that 
he just did tshuva. See that? He, he didn't turn around and come to the, to, the, to the davening. It was Shabbos. He didn't start observing Shabbos. He went ahead and played golf. Why, why was he moved to say Shana Tova? He wanted me to know that he's Jewish. Is that not tshuva? And I would venture to say that any other time of the year, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have said, good Shabbos. I, I don't think. But it's the high holy days. And every Jewish soul is a little, is a little conscious of something. They don't know what it is. But when he said, Shana Tova, that's tshuva. That's the Jew saying, I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm a member of the tribe. I have not quit. I have not changed my identity. I am the children of Israel, just as Jews always were. Nothing really has changed. I just don't know what I'm doing. It's enviable. He went out of his comfort zone. He went out of his habit because it was Rosh Hashanah. If we all did that, we would all be much better people. Um, that's Hopefully that's coming. Um, Rabbi Friedman, usually on Rosh Hashanah, um, all people wish the Jewish people um, Happy New Year, Happy Rosh Hashanah, not understanding that this is not a Jewish holiday. It's everybody's holiday. It's uh, the birth of humanity. Um, what about Yom Kippur? Does that have um, a meaning for all nations, all people as well? Or is that very particular to the Jewish people? I think Rosh Hashanah is more universal. We actually say in, in the text of the Rosh Hashanah prayer, Today is the day when God decides the fate of all nations. Which nation will prosper and which nation will not. So everyone is being um, recorded in the book of life. All nations, all people. Yom Kippur is more personal because it started with forgiveness for the golden calf. We are the ones who made the golden calf. <laughs> <laughs> Not proud of it. <laughs> Much to our shame, <laughs> right? But let me mention this really. Maybe I mentioned it before. There's an interesting midrash. The sages say Moses was up on the mountain. Moshe was on Mount Sinai. He was basically in heaven receiving the Ten Commandments from God. He came down off the, oh, so God said to him, all of a sudden, like, you have to go down the mountain. The people messed up. They made a graven image. Moshe comes down off the mountain. This is all in the text of the Torah. He sees the golden calf and the people dancing around it. He throws the tablets, the Ten Commandments, he throws them down to the ground and breaks them. The tablets were very heavy. They were made out of marble. And they were cubes, not flat panels. They were massively heavy. The question is, oh, so God thanks Moshe for breaking the tablets because the tablets were like the contract between the Jews and God, the contract in which it says that the Jews will not make graven images. So Moshe felt, I can't deliver the contract. I have to void it so that the people will not be held responsible. They never got the contract. 
So he breaks it. And God thanks him for saving the people by doing that. That, that we all know from the text of the Torah. The sages came and said, why would Moshe carry the tablets down the mountain and then break them when he saw the golden calf? God told him while he was up in heaven that the Jews had made a golden calf. Why didn't he just leave the Ten Commandments in heaven? Why bring the contract and then tear it up? Don't bring it. Why schlep it down the mountain? <laughs> Amazing statement that the sages came up with. They said simply, Moshe didn't believe it. God told him they made a golden calf and Moshe did not believe it. <laughs> That's, that is awesome. <laughs> he didn't believe it. He wouldn't believe it about his people. Now that's a real leader. God said they did. No, he doesn't believe it. This man who believes everything that God says, but not that. <clears throat> not until he saw it with his own eyes. What a lesson in Sympathy, empathy, devotion to a people. So I'm trying to understand, like, how do, how do these two things work? You believe everything God says, but not this. So a simple explanation is, you're not supposed to believe it. God doesn't want you to believe it. And the proof is, God said to Moshe, I've had it with these people. That's it, I'm wiping them out. Moshe said, no, no. <laughs> that's, you see, that's what you're supposed to say. But it's more than that. Of course, Moshe believed what God said. But he immediately assumed that God meant something mystical, something very subtle, on some level, heavenly something. The Jews may be harbored some doubts about God, and that's what God meant by graven image. But not literally a graven image. So he believed God, but he assumed that that meant something very subtle, mystical. When he came down off the mountain and saw that it was a, a physical statue, that he was shocked. So that teaches us an interesting lesson. When God says, I'm angry at you, I've had it with you, 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 you I hate you, 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 you sicken me, and he does say that sometimes in the Torah. I despise my people. We're supposed to say, well, yeah, on some mystical level somewhere in the heaven of heavens, we must have touched the nerve but don't take it literally. So all the curses in the Torah that God will do this and God will do that, on some mystical level, but not literally. On the other hand, when God says, you are mine forever, I cannot be without you. No matter what you do, I cannot abandon you. That you take literally. That's not mystical. That's real. So that's what Moshe was doing. All the negative stuff, he assumed that that meant something very subtle, mystical. True in heaven, but not applicable to earth. But all the good stuff meant literally, physically applicable to the physical, limited human beings that God knows we are. That's, that's a good heart. That is true kindness. So, when we come to Yom Kippur and we say, today you have to apologize for all your sins. What sins? You know, all that subtle stuff that on some level maybe 
But in the physical, you don't. You couldn't sin if you wanted to. You don't even know how to sin like a mensch. <laughs> in the olden days, they could sin. Whoa, they were good at it. Because they knew God, and they knew what holiness meant, and they knew what heaven meant, and they knew what hell meant, and they knew, they knew, and they did it anyway. Now, there's a sin. We, we don't know. You know, we sometimes feel a little rebellious, and we're going to do something sinful. So it's so, it's so awkward and clumsy and amateurish. We're such amateur sinners compared to the good old days. <laughs> so in the good old days, punishment applied because we knew how to sin. <laughs> I, think, I think back then, and this is a lesson in life, back then when people sinned, they were expecting punishment because their intention was to get God angry. If they were not punished, they would be so disappointed. Hey, hey, where's justice? <laughs> I sinned. Don't get any reaction for that? Today, we don't have that. You know, so when a child rebels or acts out, and you're very tolerant, and you don't say anything, and you're not hurt, and you're not upset, they're so disappointed. <laughs> They wanted to get a rise out of you. What are you, neglecting me? I just did something terrible. Aren't you going to scream? They're disappointed. So you do have to react to bad behavior. Don't overreact. But you got to be paying attention. Children get very frustrated when they do something bad and you just ignore them. Like, how bad do I have to be to get a reaction from you? So, Yom Kippur, for us, is very different than it was in the desert with Moshe or in the temple with King Solomon. It's different. We're different. Sins are different. It's not the same. And that's what judgment means. God judges. He doesn't just punish. He's not punishing. He's just. Which means if you deserve punishment, you get a punishment. If you deserve a reward, you get a reward. So we shouldn't, we can't, we mustn't assume punishment. That's not judgment. That's like a Russian court. <laughs> You're going to get punished, but we'll just go through the charade, you know, and how do you plead? doesn't really matter. Nobody's listening. You're getting punished. <laughs> <laughs> but with God, there really is judgment. So you can't assume punishment. In fact, you should assume reward. Because even if you're carrying your golf bag on Shabbos and it's your Rosh Hashanah, and you go out of your way to say, Shana Tova, you deserve a reward, not a punishment. Rabbi Friedman, I don't know how you manage to do this every time, but even when we speak um, about Yom Kippur and atonement for the sins, we still manage to end up on a positive note with you, and I'm very, very grateful for you for that and for so, so much more for um, all the enlightenment and wisdom that you give us every Tuesday, and um, I can't wait till we meet again next Tuesday and speak about more spiritual, more godly stuff and get more light and positivity from you. Thank you very, very much. Do we much. have another minute? For you always. We'll move everything. Well, right now people are busy buying their lulav and their etrog and the myrtles and the willows, right? They represent four different realities. Some of them have a good smell, an aroma, but not a good taste. Like the myrtle, smells delicious, but don't, don't try to eat it. And then there are those that have a very good taste, like the, the palm, 
branch. Um, but they don't have a very good smell. Some have both a good smell and a good taste, and the willow has not a good taste and not a good smell. So they represent the four different types of people because the smell represents mitzvahs and taste represents Torah. So there are those who are great in the study of Torah and in the performance of mitzvahs. So they have a good smell and a good taste. And then there's the willow that is not great in the study and not great in the doing. So it has no good taste and no good smell. And somebody pointed out that this year, the willow is the most important of all. No taste, no smell. Those are the symptoms of the virus. <laughs> <laughs> you lose your taste and you lose your smell. Thank you for that great joke, Rabbi. <laughs> And yet, it is a part of the mitzvah. So if you include it with the others, in other words, if you surround the, uh, the, the symptoms of the flu with good taste and good smell and purposeful living, that, that can elevate even the willow. Without the smell and without the taste, it can cure you thoroughly and give you a really meaningful, blessed, productive year. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, always amazing. Shalom Aleichem. How are you? You know, I do a lot of talking, a lot of Zooming, many classes, many subjects. But that's all formal stuff. Hopefully good stuff, but formal. We also have a Wednesday night meeting that's more informal and kind of um, Hamish. If you want to join us for that kind of an event, um, interactive, time for questions and so on, if you want to join us for this side of conversation, click on the link below and join us every Wednesday night at nine o'clock well, maybe not every Wednesday night, but we try to make it every Wednesday night at nine o'clock, a more informal chat, which uh, can be more enjoyable at times than the formal stuff. So check it out. Click on the link and join us. Try it. You'll like it. <laughs>